My favourite riding kit is a pair of bike jeans and a leather jacket. I love that I can wander around off the bike in them, but I do expect them to protect me. Now I've worn motorcycle jeans with a separate arrow middle lining for many years, but there are now loads of single layer jeans out there, some of which are supposed to be safer than anything else on the market. But research in this video has revealed a mess of false claims, abuse of people's understanding of the laws around kit testing and some shocking results. It's even highlighted the flaws with the new EN 17092 certification standard. This is a story of good and bad intentions, months of testing, failures, and ultimately, the information we all need to make vital buying decisions for ourselves. Now influencers want to earn from their channels and shops want to sell you things. Now I'm paid a salary to make videos that we hope you enjoy, but the reason I do it is to keep the Bennetts and Bike Social names in your mind. The thing is, Bike Social's editorial is completely independent. We do have a membership platform with hundreds of discounts on training, track days, kit and more, and we do have partners on there who give discounts to our members. But this is completely separately managed. Check it out at bikesocial.co.uk forward slash join and you'll see that there's a massive mix on there, including products I've been impressed with and some that I haven't. I also need to stress that having worked in motorcycle publishing since 1996, of course I know a lot of the people behind the brands, but that simply makes it easier to have those conversations when I, or one of our trusted reviewers, think something isn't up to scratch. I'll stress it again, nobody had any influence on this test, it's completely independent. And to really drive the point home that our content is about building trust in our brands and making stuff that you enjoy and that helps you, all of the revenue from this video is gonna be donated to charity just before Christmas this year. I've got a few in mind, but let me know in the comments below which motorcycle related charity you think deserves to get everything we'll have made from this. I'll produce a video in December showing the YouTube analytics info and announce where the money will go. Now you can help by liking this video, hitting the subscribe button and sharing with all your rider groups because the more people watch this, the more people will be able to make an informed choice when buying jeans and the more money will go to charity. Now let's first explain the current safety ratings. Typically you'll be looking at A, AA or AAA under the EN 17092 standard. Now these ratings are based on a series of tests including abrasion resistance, tear and burst strength. You'll find a link in the description to an article I wrote that fully explains what all the labels mean in anything you're buying. And you might also see some garments rated as B. Now, these are designed for motorcycle use, but don't have armor fitted. It's not true that these are always the lowest rated single A with no armor. Even if something could way exceed AAA in abrasion, tear and burst, it'd still be a B if it had no armor. And it is only tested to the A level, that's true. I feel like I need to add a bit of clarity here. So when you're testing for abrasion on the Darmstadt machine under 17092, you're testing to a level A, AA or AAA. The old system used to test to a uh, point of failure so you'd know how long it could, uh, how much it could achieve. It's not true to say that uh, a garment that is B rated has only got A levels of abrasion resistance because it may well be a garment that was already tested to AAA and its abrasion burst and tear resistance could be fine. But if it's got no armor, it will only ever be an A. The other thing to remember is that, as you'll see later in this video, the armor makes a huge difference, not just to impact protection, but also to the abrasion resistance of the garment. So you do have to treat a B rated garment as offering the lowest levels because you can't know for sure. The abrasion resistance of kit is tested under 17092 using what's called a Darmstadt machine, which spins samples on a concrete slab. And before this rating system was introduced, motorcycle clothing was tested using a Cambridge machine, which for jackets and trousers used a 60 grit belt running at 18 mile an hour. The samples were dropped from a specific height and with a set weight behind them to see how long they'd last. That is a difference between the Cambridge test and the Darmstadt machine, in that the Cambridge can test to a point of failure, whereas Darmstadt you decide what you want to test and you test to that level. And while technically anything described as protective should have been tested with the Cambridge machine since 1994 as part of EN 13595, most textile kits struggled to meet it and it wasn't enforced. But too many brands took the piss and kept saying their kit was protective without proving it. So, from 21st of April 2018, all motorcycle clothing sold in the UK and the EU has to be certified as personal protective equipment, by law. 
So now we have the easier to achieve EN17992 test method to get that certification. And where problems start is that some brands and stores will quote slide times, which would infer that it's a measure of the time a rider could safely slide down the road. Now this is incorrect and it also leaves them open to potential litigation should a rider have a crash where it can be asserted in proceedings that the garment did not live up to the manufacturer or the store's claims. Anyway, the idea of a slide time has come from how long a sample might last on a Cambridge machine, but the times achieved here are only ever a relative abrasion figure. And while the Cambridge machine gives an excellent analogue to real world road crashes on both highly abrasive top dress surfaces and smoother asphalt, it is not a slide time. And there's certainly not an official CE slide time. There's no such thing. I spoke to Dr. Chris Huron, Senior Research Fellow in Fibre Science and Technology at the Institute for Frontier Materials in Deakin University, Australia. He's also leading the outstanding MotorCat website, which is offering exhaustive tests on riding kit. I really do urge you to check it out in the description. If you look, abrasion is totally removal of fibers, whether it's leather or whether it's textiles, we're physically dragging those fibers out of the surface unless we're on a super smooth surface and then it becomes the damage that occurs from actually rubbing on the surface of the material. Right. Um, and then, so if we go to a really smooth concrete or a relatively smooth asphalt, uh, it, it becomes physically wearing away individual fibers until you break them and pull them from the material. But if we go to a, a, a rougher asphalt or we go to a, a road that's been top dressed with a rock, um, so a bitumen coating and then a rock, like yeah. some of your roads in the UK are, um, and a lot of our roads in Australia are actually made that way, they call them spray seal or chip seal, those surfaces are incredibly abrasive to motorcycle clothing. So a, a standard chip seal surface is four and a half times more abrasive than your typical asphalt surface. Wow. Uh, uh, and... Okay. Interestingly enough, the Cambridge machine, when we test our on-road machine, the Cambridge machine is almost identical to the chip seal surface, but it's four and a half times longer on an asphalt surface to wear through a sample than what it is on the Cambridge machine. So if we had a half second fabric on the Cambridge machine, we would expect that to last, um, what, uh, two and a quarter seconds on asphalt. The Cambridge machine is still very much in use and Dr. Hurran and his team have run hundreds of real world tests that show how valid it is. It was invented by Dr. Roderick Woods, so I spoke to him too. He told me that the Cambridge type machine gives a time to perforation in a constant velocity abrasion on a standard abrasive cloth. This is normalized against a standard reference cloth to give a calculated relative abrasion time. This relative abrasion time was also determined on clothing involved in actual road accidents and on multiple fabric and leather samples tested in a simulated accident. Now, you might find some people claiming that Kevlar, which is a DuPont brand of aramid fiber, degrades when it's washed, but this is wrong. So normal washing is actually better. So if you've got a pair of protective denim jeans that have got Kevlar in them or a knitted structure or something like that, washing them is actually good for the protective liner. You won't damage Kevlar or Dyneema or Spectra or Vectran or any of these products yeah. with normal washing that you'll do. The only way you'll damage them is if you bleach them. Kevlar can be less effective against projectiles when wet, but it's not used to stop 7.62 rounds in jeans. The propaganda around Kevlar being harmed by water was mainly down to a big brand a good few years ago that didn't use Kevlar in its jeans. That doesn't mean their product was bad, but I have a serious pet hate about companies that slag off others to make what they're pushing seem good. The best brands I've dealt with live off their own qualities and are always happy to acknowledge the good in their competitors. There are many different materials used to construct motorcycle jeans, but they all have their own advantages, and any garment is only as good as the sum of its parts. I mean, you, you can't, for instance, claim that an ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene, or UHMWPE, is the best on its own, as it has to be combined with other materials to be at its most effective. It has a melting temperature of 160 degrees Celsius, but it starts to lose strength from about 80 degrees Celsius. Now, when we test that on the Cambridge machine with a 60 grit belt, we physically see melting at the back end of the sample. Right. Uh, because the ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, even though it's ripping fibers out, there's still enough heat transfer that we melt. 
It is funny some of the uh, demonstrations that brands will use to show how tough their jeans are, like lifting cars or skips with them. That's not got much real world relevance to falling off a bike and sliding down the road, but it does, to me at least, sum up how some will try to muddy the waters. And while not perfect, the A to AAA railings are there to help you. So don't let anyone try to distract you from them. And know that there are calls, including from some brands, to reintroduce a higher safety rating, which will be great for us buyers. And I, I should also say that we've seen since 2018 that prices have not gone up due to this certification. It is there to help you. And something that's also cropped up has been what's called shear force or skin shear injuries. At the moment, there's very little discussion on skin shear at all in motorcycle injury because it, it's not seen. So if, you, if you're like me and you're riding down the road and you hit a bit cow poo and you fall off, um, you get up and you hop back on the bike and you keep riding, you're not going to report that. So if you've got any injuries, you're not going to um, go to a hospital. It's not going to be recorded. So there's very little info on skin shear. And in most cases, skin shear really is only going to be seen at, at any level in people where they haven't worn holes in their clothing and needed to go to the doctor. Um, because what happens is the clothing couples up with, with, the, with the body and causes either, um, it either moves over the skin um, without breaking the fabric and, 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 and abrades away on the surface of the skin, or it couples up with the skin and actually delaminates inside the body. And it's really, really, really evident in old people, in old people's home, skin shear is a massive thing. If you grab an old person and you drag them out of bed, rather than lifting them out of bed, you'll cause skin shear injury. Because right. their body's not as strong. Um, yeah. So we're a little bit more resilient because we're a bit younger. Um, yeah. But but um, skin shear is really, really, really predominant just from dragging someone out of bed in a hospital. Um, so they're really, really careful with it. So it's definitely happening in clothing. Now, one of the ways around it is to put a um, slippery layer on the inside of the clothing. If we look at GP riders, it's been well known in the GP riding circles for a long time. You wear silk underneath your leather. Uh, and the reason they do that is to give a slippery inner layer and a, and a grippy outer layer. The outer layer will grip up with the silk and then slip on the silk rather than slipping on your body. And yeah. that's what they try with those cool max layers and, and uh, the, the, the slippery mesh layers. How severe can a skin shear injury be in motorcycle? How, how much of an thing can it not be? Not that bad. Not that bad. It's, 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 it's worse than a bruise. Um, yep. but it, it's not to the level that it will de be, be debilitating. But they typically take up to three weeks to heal. Skin shear is unlikely to be a serious injury, particularly in younger riders, but having that comfort liner, which can also help keep you cooler in summer and a little warmer in winter, reduces the risk of a potentially painful wound. So while I wouldn't say it's vital you have one, I prefer it and I do make sure my jeans have it. So now we've got some of our facts straight, I want to find out what the best motorcycle jeans are. It is always going to be a balance between comfort and protection, but could single layer jeans offer the same levels of safety? These are the Hood K7 AAA jeans and cost £177.99 with slimline D3 O ghost armour at the knees and the hips. This company was one of the first to meet its legal requirements for safety certification under 17092, and I've worn their jeans for a good few years. They're not the only brand making motorbike jeans like this, but as they're what I've worn for a long while and they represent a quality line jean, I want to know how they compare to the toughest single layer kit. Moto Legends reckons that single layer jeans can be way stronger than leather, and it says that the £349 Roka Rokatech straight jean in raw denim is pretty much the strongest wearable fabric on the market. So I bought a pair. They only come with knee armour though. Hip armour is an option, but it's an extra £19.99. Thing is, while there's no mention on the Motor Legends website about the CE rating they achieve, when they arrived they turned out to be only A rated. Now on the website at the time, the Rokatech tapered slims were double A rated with a slide time of 4.9 seconds. But on that page it said, if you want the ultimate in protection, go for the full fat Rokatex. And those jeans I bought had what was claimed to be an official CE slide time of 6.39 seconds. And it still says that now as I film this video. We already know that these slide times are irrelevant, but I emailed to ask what they were based on. Chris told me that for any gene where we quote a slide time, we will hold on file the test certificate from an accredited test house who will have conducted a test on a Cambridge machine. 
Sometimes, if the manufacturer has not conducted one, we will commission someone like Sartre to conduct a test specifically for us. Now, I asked if I could see the test report, but he wasn't prepared to share it. At the time of filming, Roker's own site is the only one I could find mentioning the CE rating of level A. None of the other UK sellers featured it either. Anyway, with these jeans only being A rated on the actual official CE test standard of EN17092, Despite being claimed to be the toughest out there, I ended up also getting a set of AAA rated jeans from another brand which cost £179. I felt I had to be able to compare a lined and unlined pair of AAA rated jeans. And this would help us see the difference between A and AAA. I feel like I need to add a bit again here. It might seem odd that I haven't named the AAA single layer jeans. The point is, this is meant to be looking at the construction methods of um, jeans, so single layer or lined. Uh, and that was always the intention. And, you know, I based it on the most active on the market, you know, the most active on social media and online and everything. And when those rogues arrived and they were A, it kind of left me thinking, well, I still want to know because, you know, they, they, they do appear to be really good. And I genuinely want to know what's, what, you know, what's the kind of the best abrasion resistance, what's, what should I wear? Um, uh, but when they're A, it left it open of, well, they could, what would AAA do then? But then it started becoming a test of specific genes and these are the best, we've done a group test. And I said, that was never the intention. I just wanted to keep that out of it and just keep it simple because we're not trying to promote or discredit brands or anything like that. We're just trying to get to the bottom of what's going on. For completeness, I also got a pair of cheap supermarket jeans to see how they compare. And before taking pictures of how they fitted on my fairly average frame, I washed them all three times in plain water at 30 degrees C, then got to testing. I wanted to create a real world test, something, something that would truly demonstrate how protective these different types of jeans are in a slide down the road. So I built a rig. I designed it to fix to the back of the car and welded it up out of steel box section with the bottoms of catering CO2 canisters to carry the samples, each of which weighed four kilograms when I'd load them with sand. I then made a timing circuit that would start the moment the samples were dropped then count in milliseconds until a fine wire under each sample was abraded through. Now that's the same basic timing system as used on the Cambridge machine, and it'd mean I could accurately record the abrasion times of each gene. And I built the rig to test four samples at a time, and as I wanted to test the claims that motorcycle jeans can be way stronger than leather, I also got samples from BKS Made to Measure. Now this is the same leather used in their excellent quality suits, though keep in mind that I'm only using one layer, not the two that are in the key impact areas. Doubling up on any material more than doubles the abrasion resistance as the multiple layers help absorb the energy in a crash. Anyway, with the rig all built, it was onto an old section of the A1, so it's a very real representation of a road where it was also safe to drive at a steady 30 mile per hour before dropping the samples and seeing the damage. didn't work. Well, it worked, but the results were too inconsistent. Watching the footage back, you could see the sample carriers were bouncing way too much, which that caused additional impacts and meant they spent varying lengths of time in the air. The carrier arms also had too much movement in them. I couldn't get the timer wires consistently, I couldn't get them in consistently the right place. So I ended up having to just use a visual guide of the damage. I still tested all the samples in different positions on the rig and with or without their own armor behind them, but it, it, was, it was a full day of testing them all, but the numbers just weren't consistent enough. All I did learn with any reliability was that having the armor fitted makes a very big difference to the abrasion resistance. There is, of course, a lot more stuff there to wear out, but it also absorbs a huge amount of the energy, making the outer layer last longer. Now, I know some people leave the armor out of their jeans because it looks nicer, but honestly, it does more than just protect you from the impact. I won't wear my jeans without it in the knees and the hips. They're bony areas, even on my flabby frame, so please use it. The other thing that was very obvious from my testing was that plain denim jeans, so not proper bike jeans, they can burst the moment they hit the road. Now, this was utterly consistent, even when I tried dropping the samples and immediately lifting them again. And it wasn't a surprise to me as I've come off in jeans in the past and lost a lump out of my knee. The thing is, I had a mate who crashed in jeans and he was fine. I've fallen off in plain jeans at the roundabout at the bottom of our road, a pretty well walking pace, and they hold instantly and I got yep. a, not, yeah, 
critical, but I got a nasty gouge out of yeah. my neck. Yeah, I've had a friend who crashed in normal jeans at speed, and it was fine. And he's always said, Do you know oh, I'm why? So you imagine it. If you're falling at a high speed, the period of time that you push the fabric into the ground is yeah. much, much shorter than when you start to pull on it. Yeah. Because yeah. your arm is doing 100 kilometers an hour. You now have your arm doing 10 kilometers an hour. You're pushing it into the ground for much, much more before you yeah. pull on it. So burst failure is actually worse at slow speeds than what it is at high speeds. And you suffered burst failure when you fell off your bike. Heavy duty plane denim can actually pass EN17992's abrasion test on the Darmstadt rig. And the Cambridge machine is a more realistic example of a bad crash on the grippier surfaces, but it's an accurate real world worst case. Remember, the combination of tests carried out for 17992 do prove that the kit you're buying has some level of protection, so it is still a really valuable certification. I guess this rig wasn't a complete waste of time as we learned how important it is to wear the armour and that we shouldn't just wear plain jeans. The real world is way too chaotic for testing and that's why having a reliable and repeatable analogue is so important. It's why Dr Roderick Woods' work was so important in the early days and it's why it's still the basis for Dr. Hohen and his team, who have worked for so long in setting up MotorCap. I guess I probably was being a bit optimistic to think I could do it myself in just a week of long days and late nights. But anyway, we still haven't answered the question of whether single layer jeans are more protective than lined jeans or even leather. So I sent samples to an independent testing house for abrasion testing on the Cambridge machine using the EN13595 standard 60 grip belt. Remember, the 60 grit belt is a very close analog to a top dress road, which has stones pressed into the top layer of bitumen, whereas a 120 grit belt is closer to a plain asphalt road. Now the less coarse 120 grit belt is not part of the official EN13595 testing for jackets or trousers, though it is what's used for glove testing. And not all of our roads are the sharpest and most abrasive, of course, but it makes sense to me that we should consider a worst case scenario when testing for protection, and Dr. Hohen agreed. And just so you know, the abrasion times on the 120 grit belt are about four times longer. I had enough left in the jeans for three tests of each, from which a mean relative abrasion resistance time could be given. Now, some people might call this a slide time, but they'd be wrong. The A-rated single layer rokers got 2.01 seconds. The AAA rated single layer jeans got 2.03 seconds. The AAA rated hoods, which are lined, got 4.34 seconds. The single layer of BKS leather got 4.86 seconds. And remember if you were sliding on your bum, for instance, the leathers would be double layer here, so they'd perform more than twice as well as the lined jeans. And the abrasion times of the single layer jeans aren't bad, and on asphalt roads they do even better, but these are some telling numbers. Less than half the relative abrasion time from two different pairs of single layer multi-circle jeans compared to a lined pair, and certainly not the 50% better abrasion resistance than leather, which has been claimed in some videos. This was a test of the material only, not how it would perform with armour behind it, but it shows exactly what I wanted to know. It turns out that with all the hype and the spin stripped away, lined motorcycle jeans tested by an independent lab on a Cambridge machine do offer significantly better abrasion resistance than single layer. I am glad I added a set of AAA single layer jeans to this test as it showed how there's more to the rating than just the abrasion resistance. And no test is perfect, but we know that 13595 offers the closest analog to road abrasion with its Cambridge machine. The Rokers might have only achieved level A in 17092 due to a lower result in tear or burst resistance, which are just as important. Now, someone might claim the Rokers were only tested to level A and could have done better, but that's the point of certification, to prove your claims. Without this proof, buyers can only guess and hope. It's the responsibility of the manufacturer to put its products through the testing to prove it will meet anything higher. So be wary if anyone tries to tell you otherwise. And again, remember, this has not put prices up. Look across the range. I'm not saying things that can be too expensive or too cheap, but look across the range of prices and we still see the same prices in, in price brackets. Oh, and know that only in the AAA level does the bum get counted as a key impact area. So anything below that, A or AA, isn't proven to have the same degree of protection there. And we're seeing more and more products meeting AAA now, and as I've mentioned, some brands are already looking at how they can demonstrate higher levels of protection. 
And there is also work going on that should see an official higher standard added soon. Look, don't let anyone tell you what to wear. Not me, not a sponsored influencer, and not a salesman. A helmet is all that's required by law, but what really matters to me is that you understand what you're buying. Understand what the safety ratings mean, then buy what you feel comfortable in and enjoy riding. Don't believe all you read or hear. There's lots of content dressed up as advice, but everyone has an agenda. Ours is brand awareness because we don't sell kit or motorcycles and we don't take kickbacks. And remember, every like and subscribe that this video gets will give more money to charity as I promise to give all the revenue away at Christmas. Don't forget to pop those suggestions in the comments. Maybe the air ambulance, blood bikers, NABD, riders for health. Give me some ideas. Good quality leather in a properly constructed suit with multiple layers and secure stitching remains the safest option. But it's all about finding the right balance for you. I really, really don't want this video to scare you into only going out in leathers. Now, obviously we wear them on track and I do on the road sometimes depending on what and where I'm riding. But I do also wear single layer as well as fully lined jeans. You can also wear textiles, of course, and I have a video coming up next about the best brands, so do hit subscribe to not miss it. But the protection levels there will vary too. Still, BKS does make textiles that meet the tough EN13595 abrasion testing, so it can be done. I'll wear textiles if there's the slightest chance of rain. And when I'm buzzing around town or sat in the office all day, I'll sometimes wear single layer jeans, though always with a comfort liner and with full armor. When I'm going further or faster though, or I'm on a press launch, that means I'm having to ride quickly on unknown roads anywhere in the world, but I still want the casual style, I'll continue to wear my lined jeans. And in my case, that's hood. Even walking around London all day or working in Spain, Portugal, Italy, the Canary Islands and the US, I've never found them to be too hot. And I've got plenty of my own insulation. The thing is, that's my choice. If you like the Rokers, that's great. I'm not trying to say they're bad. And Rokers own website is clear about the certified rating they achieve. So there at least you can make an informed choice. But I would add the hip arm. And personally, I'd rather have jeans that have been proven to meet the highest standards. I've tested a pair of well-respected line jeans, a pair of AAA rated single layer jeans, and a pair of what were claimed by the shop to be the best single layer jeans on the market. After genuine independent lab testing and speaking to real experts, I'm confident that line jeans remain the most protective option for this style of kit. There are lots of good brands out there at a range of prices. The ones I choose to wear certainly aren't the only you can buy. And you might not want to wear thicker lined jeans. It depends what and how you ride. Narrow it down to a few brands you like the look of and are in your budget. Check the safety ratings, then look at the details. I like hoods, not just because I feel safe in them, but because they have smooth rivets that won't scratch the bike. The pockets are denim lined, which lasts a lot longer when you're shoving your keys in and out. And while they are a little hotter than single layer jeans, they're a lot better than some I've tried. So I find them comfortable and confidence inspiring. And of course, they're very well priced. Take all these things into account and then choose what you want to. You can read reviews of all the jeans we've tested at bikesocial.co.uk and we're always updated that. So check it out and buy what you want. And I would also say, check out the Motocap website for really in-depth uh, safety testing as well. Strike your own balance between levels of protection and comfort. I hope that now you can do it with more knowledge of what you're spending your money on. And don't forget to check back at Christmas and see how much money we've raised for charity. Just ride safe and enjoy yourself because motorbikes are awesome. And I'll leave the last word to Dr. Hohen. You're better to be in any type of riding gear than no riding gear at all. Yeah. Now you might have noticed that it's a bit messier than usual in here and it's because I've been working on this VFR 800 for all weekend it's just gone and five nights solid just it's when I got it you, you might have seen the video where I took it for an MOT and it, it ran great when I got it but then like an idiot I left the tank pretty well empty because um, I thought I was going to strip it down straight away but then I ended up with loads of work on with other stuff I was doing. Then the Tracer 9 GT long term I went back and it's time to start riding this. I couldn't wait. 
took it out and it just kept dying when I, when I was starting it. I was like, okay, well, you know, I'll keep it running. Oh, I, I realized it was pretty well empty, so I had to put some in from the jerry can. And then when I went down the road, it was just graunching on the clutch and kept grabbing and stalling. The fuel injection light was coming on. It was dangerous to ride. I still took it out, but it was horrible. It was really bad and I was gutted. And so I got a new clutch. I got a TRK clutch from Wiimoto. Um, and uh, I had a shock to fit as well, a Hagon shock, because the suspension, and you've probably seen the video hopefully, where I got the suspension rebuilt, and it was quite interesting, well, really interesting to see how suspension is rebuilt and serviced. But the rear shock couldn't be rebuilt, so I've got a Hagon replacement shock there, which I can tell you now, I've ridden it, so that's a spoiler alert, uh, that it has massively improved it, because the damper was gone. This is a 95,000 mile bike, it's a 2001, so I expected it to be worn, but it was horrific to work on. I've got to say, it's the, I, I've, I've owned 21 bikes, and some of them have been pretty old. I've had a really old Honda Dominator that uh, you know, I just use as a winter hack, but this was awful to work on, particularly the exhaust, because the collector, it's, um, there's a bolt that holds the collector on under the engine, and that's hidden by the exhaust. So you, to get the exhaust off, you need to take the bolt off that's hidden by the exhaust. So it's really awkward to get in there but it had rotted away like a sea relic. It was awful. It was just completely corroded. I had to drill it out from one side. That got buggered up and I really struggled to get it out. Basically, it was a nightmare to rebuild. The point is, this is gonna be my new long term. I've got it running again. I've taken it straight down, uh, down south uh, as soon as I finish shooting this video. So if you wanna follow what we're gonna be doing or what I'm gonna be doing with this VFR, again, another reason to hit subscribe. But it's great to ride, it's bloody horrible to work on.